Thank you, Adam, very much. And thank you, dear friends. It's great to be back in Canada. It's great to be back at the Met. And um, you and the staff, especially your staff team, have been so wonderful to us. We have received much more than we could ever repay. I was telling the earlier congregation that we were not welcome in Costco uh, because the Australian ID doesn't work to get into Costco, but the Met has allowed us in, which is wonderful. We appreciate your welcome very much. And today is your Thanksgiving weekend, and Jonathan told me uh, when I was back in Australia that it would be the Thanksgiving weekend, and I said to him, why don't we look at the little passage in Luke 17, uh, and so I'm going to ask if you would turn with me to Luke 17. I'm not sure if I've ever preached on this passage before on its own, but Luke 17, and I'm going to read verses 11 to 18. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. Now it happened as Jesus went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go, Show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. The background to this particular reading is Jesus moving toward Jerusalem. And as he heads towards Jerusalem, he's teaching carefully. And many of you will know that in Luke 15, he teaches some stories about being lost and found like the prodigal son. Then in chapter 16, he teaches some stories about waking up to the plan of God and the, to the whole concept of eternity. And in chapter 17, he seems to dwell on what I will call some dangers. One of them is the danger of relationships, getting in the way of people, people getting in the way of you. Another danger in this particular chapter are doubts, doubts as to whether God will look after you. And the passage today I'm calling the problem of games, playing games with God, because here are 10 people in the text who receive a lot from Jesus, but nine of them play a game which is called take and run, and only one of them really comes back and in the end does business with Jesus. And if you don't think this is significant, dear friends, let me tell you, it's eternally significant. To get good things, but not trace them back to God, is a very dangerous game. When I was waking up on Friday, I was thinking about this passage coming and I thought we could divide it into three headings. And the three headings are, first of all, a sad, platitude, verses 11 to 13. Second, a spiritual attitude, verses 14 to 16. And thirdly, a salvation gratitude, verses 17 to 18. I don't normally have silly rhymes, in, but it just occurred to me as I was waking up, and perhaps it will help you to remember, there's a platitude, an attitude, and a gratitude. And um, if I bump into you, I might see whether you've remembered these three. So avoid me at all costs in the break. <laughs> First of all, a sad platitude, chapter 17, verse 11. We see Jesus here on his way to Jerusalem, and he meets 10 lepers. We don't know whether these lepers are Jews from Galilee or whether they're half Jews from Samaria, because we're just told that he's passing through the middle. 
But these 10 men have a problem, and the problem is leprosy, and the problem has brought them together, just like patients in a hospital might be together, or citizens after a hurricane work together. And leprosy, as we read in verse 12, meant that you had to live life at a distance. So you couldn't mix like normal people, you couldn't shop like normal people, you couldn't go working like normal people, you couldn't have a normal family life, you're often cut off from your family, friends, and everybody else. So this was a miserable and a lonely disease. And these men were entirely dependent on the kindness of strangers. You think of the people in every big city who live on the streets. Especially think of those people who actually don't have a home, don't have any income, and don't have any answers. We have in Sydney, Australia, a welfare, a big welfare agency, and once a year they invite tycoons and CEOs to sleep rough on the street. But it's only for a night, but even after one night, many of these wealthy men and women will pay very big checks toward the welfare and the relief of people on the street. These 10 lepers are in very, very great need. And of course now, amazingly, Jesus comes past and they lift up their voice. Literally, it says they lift up their one voice. And this is what they say. Jesus, master, have mercy on us. That's all they say. It's four words in the original. And they obviously believe that Jesus is the master. They've heard that from somewhere. And I suppose most people in the world today know that Jesus is probably full of power. And then they call him merciful. And I would guess that most people in the world today know that Jesus, if you are really desperate, would be merciful or could be merciful. But of course, these men wouldn't have called out if their lives had been wonderful. I mean, who needs Jesus the master and Jesus the merciful when your life is great? That's the problem with your country, isn't it? And mine as well. The problems that come to us, and we have lots of problems in both our countries, but nothing that we think we can't solve. Nothing that really makes us desperate nothing that really makes us humble, nothing that really makes us fall on our knees and lift up our prayer. I was reminded recently of how many people returned to church after World War II. People in their thousands went back to churches. But it's been 80 years nearly since World War II. And we're in a very sort of DIY, do-it-yourself type of world. And even when God rattles our cage with a pandemic, you don't find many, many turn to prayer. We do know in our best moments, don't we, that we live on the Titanic and that we're slowly sinking into the grave. But we like to think that we're on a P&O cruise. Somebody has said that when God comes to the average person in Canada, America, or the world, he knocks gently on their door. But people say to God, no, not interested, come back another time. And so the person said, well, it's the kindness of God not to walk away because he's committed to the person. And it's also the kindness of God knock on the, not to knock on the front door again because people are not listening to the front door. And so they said, he'll take out the roof or the back wall or the central staircase. Not because God is unkind, but he is kind but he's, he's planning to move in and to transform people. Well, these 10 lepers have had their roof removed, their back wall removed. But Jesus is there to help them. Sadly, however, their sentence is really quite a platitude. Now, if you don't know what a platitude is, I'm reminded of a story of a small boy who finds a rat in his back garden and he corners the rat and kills it. And running inside, holding the rat by the tail, he runs in to tell his mum what's happened. He doesn't know that the minister, the local pastor, has called in and is talking to his mum in the kitchen. And the small boy runs into the back, through the back door into the kitchen, holding this rat and calls out, Mum, I found a rat and I killed it and I cornered it. And then seeing the minister, the pastor, he says in a very pious voice, 
and I believe the Lord has called it home. That is a platitude. That is a piece of pious shallowness. And sadly, you see these lepers say something that's really quite platitudinous. We know that they're shallow because they just want something for their bodies. The very fact that Jesus is master and merciful in the world tells us that he's come on very big business. But these lepers are happy with small help. Their prayer could have been a much better prayer, couldn't it? A much wiser prayer. They could have said something to Jesus like, Master, be merciful. We're lost. We're sinful. We're not just cut off from our village. We're cut off from God. Please have mercy on us. The most important thing of all is that we might be restored to you. But they just want better skin. And when they've got their better skin, almost all of them just push off. I don't need to tell you that the Thanksgiving in this country and in America, and in our country, we don't even have Thanksgiving. That's how backward we are. But this very sort of shallow idea of being thankful is tragically short-sighted, isn't it? Tragically self-centered. Doesn't seem to go anywhere near the God who has given everything that we have. He is the unsung hero of the universe. And the Thanksgiving focus on food and recipes and family and getting together never really goes above the ceiling, let alone to the God of heaven, the person who's provided all the plenty we have, the person who's provided his son that our souls could be safe. But he gets no credit from the world, does he? Paul says in Romans chapter 1, the people of the world do not honor him or give him thanks. And we here, my friends, today who do perhaps thank him and honor him and say grace at meals, we know that it's only because he's brought us to our senses and we've begun very feebly to thank him and to honor him. And it's a miracle. It's God's kindness that we've begun to see that all we have is traceable to him and that we've been rescued from a sad platitude. Now, the second thing is what I've called a spiritual attitude. And this is because one of the 10 has the amazing attitude of turning back to Jesus. One of our friends who supports pastors in the Ukraine and in Belarus and in Russia was actually training for the KGB before God turned him 180 degrees. He was reading the book of Revelation and was converted. He said he always liked to go to the end of a novel to find out what happens. And in the book of Revelation, he was converted. God turned him 180 degrees and now he serves the Lord and other pastors. A girl in the little church that we attend back home who's a doctor has come out of the New Age movement because somebody else who'd come out of the New Age movement told her it was a complete dead end and pointed her to Jesus in the New Testament. And now she helps other people, including patients, not to go down the road, which is a dead end. So there is a 180 degree that takes place when a person becomes a Christian. And I want you to notice in chapter 17, verse 14, that these 10 lepers have actually been sent away by Jesus to the priests for a checkup, but one of them does the 180 and comes back to him. You notice that Jesus only spoke to them. He just gave them a word. He didn't touch them. He didn't say, be clean. He just said, go. Show yourself to the priests because the priests would give the lepers the thumbs up or the thumbs down as to whether they could return to their village. And to the credit of these 10 men, they went. And they walked off with leprosy and somewhere along the journey, the leprosy disappeared and left them. Absolutely wonderful. I cannot imagine the excitement and the enjoyment of those 10 lepers as they suddenly realized their skin had been restored and they could walk towards the priests knowing that they would be told clean. And because this 
Leprosy is so often in the New Testament a, a symbol of being unclean and cut off. And because healing in the New Testament is so often a symbol of being restored and reconciled, I wonder whether these lepers walking toward the high priests are not a picture of the believer who's been told, you're clean, you're forgiven, you belong, you're walking, yes you are, towards the day of judgment where you'll be told, not a spot. Great joy, welcome. That's the work of Jesus. If ever these 10 men needed proof that Jesus was truly master and merciful, they got that proof that day, didn't they? Only one of them, however, responded well. The issue for Jesus was not that he wasn't being thanked. This is not Jesus saying, hey, who's saying thank you? The issue for Jesus is the shock and the sadness that the kindness which he had done for them was not being pursued any further. It's as if the kindness went up like a rocket and just tragically turned and crashed in the ground. As Paul says in Romans 2, the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance. We're meant to be seeing all that comes from the hand of God and tracing it back to the hand of God. Sometimes when I'm standing in the surf in Bondi Beach, uh, you here have the most beautiful country, as you know. But we have some very fine beaches. And sometimes when I'm standing in the glassy, translucent water of Bondi Beach, where the sand is beautiful and the sun is shining, and around me are all these people from different parts of the world who are actually loving the beach. And I want to say to them, if I could, I want to say to them, if you think this is good, think about the person who made it. And you might say something similar in your country. You might say, if you think this fall season is beautiful, think about the one who does it. How good he must be, how great he must be. Somebody has said, when God gives us pleasure, it's a little message that says, this is what he's like. Seek him. When God uses pain in our life, it's as if God is saying, this is what it's like without me. Seek me. Pleasure, seek me. Pain, seek me. Something has gone wrong, hasn't it, my friends? When God's gifts come on the doorstep, we take them inside and are not interested in who gave them. And if you want to know the sickness of the human heart, just look at Thanksgiving in our cities and you'll see that the link between the gifts and God has been just conveniently cut. No interest. No issue. We know as believers that our thankfulness also falls far short. We look at the people of the Old Testament grumbling in the wilderness and we think to ourselves, well, they, that was dreadful. We'll never do that. But we do. And we're so thankful for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who forgives us and is able to transform us into truly thankful people, not just for temporary blessings, but for eternal blessings. Well, this leper in verse 15 who took himself to Christ, he's a demonstration of what I'm calling a spiritual attitude because there's a number of things that he does in those two verses, 15 and 16. And I want to say again to you, please do not think that this is a simple lesson in saying thank you. Please, I'd be very disappointed if you went home and said, I think the visiting preacher told us that we should say thank you more often. No, what I'm saying to you is that God's kindness should have a revolutionary effect on us. It should cause people all over the world who are receivers of the kindness of God to be responders to the kind God. And supremely, of course, we should be transformed by the gift of his son. Because beyond all the temporal blessings is this immeasurable gift of Jesus Remember how Paul says in Romans 8, if God has given us his son, will he not along with him graciously give us all things? In fact, the lessons of this man who turned back in chapter 17 verses 15 to 16 is a good description of what everybody around the world should be doing. 
First of all, you see verse 15, he saw that he was healed. It dawned on him that he was very blessed. If he was a bitter man, he might have said something like this. Well, it's about time. And actually, I've got plenty of other problems. And when God solves all my problems, I may think about him. But he was not a bitter man. He counted this blessing as very great. And then he returned to Jesus. This was not a small decision because the other nine people were heading off to the priests. And this tenth leper had not yet had the all clear from the priests, but he couldn't stop himself from going back to say thank you to Jesus who had given him the gift. And thirdly, he glorified God because a miracle had taken place in his heart and he was crediting God with everything that he had received. And when we give glory to God, of course, we're simply, as I say, tracing our privileges, our blessings to the one who deserves to be honored. Fourthly, he fell down on his face, verse 16, at the feet of Jesus. Notice glorifying God falling in worship before Jesus. And the two go exactly together. In fact, the way to glorify God, as Paul says in Philippians 2, is that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the Father doesn't lose glory when you bow to Jesus. He's glorified when you bow to Jesus. Many years ago, there was a book published in the UK called The Myth, M-Y-T-H, of God Incarnate. The book was saying that Jesus was just a man like other men. And some of the faithful theologians got together with the authors to debate and discuss the issue. And one of them was the great Christian leader, John Stott, who ended up being one of the Queen's chaplains. And John Stott said the discussion, the debate was really going nowhere. But when the time came for lunch, they were standing in the queue of the cafeteria. And the guy who was leading the myth of God incarnate was next to him with his tray of food. And John Stott was beside him with his tray of food. And John Stott said to him, can I ask you a simple question? Do you worship Jesus? And straight away he shot back, of course not. And John Stott said to him, then you cannot be a Christian. Because in the end, the Christian is a person who worships Jesus to the glory of God the Father. And then fifthly, he thanked him. The word in the original is the word Eucharist. Good grace. Crediting God with good grace. So something's happened to this man, hasn't it? I call it a spiritual attitude because he wasn't just a good-mannered guy. He wasn't just slightly nicer than the other nine. But God was working on him to turn him round and he came back this 180 degrees and he shows all the marks of a spiritual transformation. He'd been cut off from his people. He'd been cut off from God. And now he receives this kindness and is no longer cut off from God or people. Thirdly and finally, a saving gratitude, a sad attitude, a sad platitude, a spiritual attitude. And thirdly, a saving gratitude. Some of the believers back home decided on one occasion that they would have a ministry to the local high schools and go into the schools and urge them not to ditch the Christian faith too quickly because the pressure of the culture in which we live is that it's irrelevant. And so these faithful people went into the schools and they would basically run the assembly with the permission of the headmaster to say not to ditch the Christian faith without thinking. And one of the ladies who was in the church decided that they wouldn't just talk to the school, but they would actually do something kind to the school. And they would give every member of the school lunch. Not just a talk, but we've provided for your lunch. And so she went to a CEO of one of the big chains in Sydney, actually a Christian man, and she said to him, I'm wondering if you would help us, and I'm wondering if you would give to every student at the school an apple. He thought for a very long time, and then he said to her, you're asking a lot. Do you want them to have covers? 
And she realized that although she was talking about a crunchy apple, he was talking about a computer apple. <laughs> and he was willing and able to provide everybody with a computer apple, an apple computer. We forget, don't we, that God could have more than we imagine, especially in spiritual and eternal blessings. And this man who returned got more than he ever dreamed. And that's why the climax of this little section in Luke 17, 11 to 18 is not verse 14, being cleansed of leprosy, but verse 19. Your faith, says Jesus, has made you well. Literally, your faith has saved you. You are saved, said Jesus. So this leper had everything against him in the morning, didn't he? He was a leper and he was a Samaritan. But by the time he had traced the kindness of Jesus back to the feet of Jesus, he received more than he could ever have imagined. He was saved. He got his healing through the kindness of Christ, but he turned and was saved. He received from Jesus in that moment forgiveness for the whole of his life, a place in the family of God forever, and a future beyond imagining. At that moment, he received forgiveness, a family, and a future. I don't know what it cost Jesus to heal the leper. I know that it cost him a lot to come into the world and be treated dreadfully by the world. But I do know that it cost Jesus everything to pay for this leper's sins. And it cost Jesus everything to pay for my sins. And it cost Jesus everything to pay for your sins. The journey to Jerusalem that Jesus was on finished at the cross. And Luke tells us in chapter 23 that the cross meant terrible darkness for Jesus. Darkness in the middle of the day, judgment darkness. As the sins of millions and millions of people were placed on Jesus and he took all the consequences. This Jesus, who we've been singing about and are reminded of, spent his whole life saying to God, yes, and saying to sin, no. Every minute of every hour of every day of his life, yes to God, no to sin. In order to pay for people like me, who so regularly says no to God and yes to sin, and people like you, who so regularly say no to God, and yes to sin. And the darkness which he experienced and the suffering and the judgment is beyond our comprehension. And out of it has come this gift of light and life eternal. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to realize that the Christ who is so good to us has more to give us in salvation than we could ever get in this world. He literally outweighs the world. And it's a very tragic thing to think that many who get so much from God in this country and in my country of a temporal kind never trace it back to God, never honor him, never get blessed with what he has for them. It's a tragedy. Were there ten cleansed, said Jesus? There were. Where are the nine, said Jesus? Good question. And to all of you here today who follow the path, you followed the path to Christ. And now you follow the path with Christ. You have had your past taken care of. Your present is taken care of. Your future is taken care of. You have not only received all the temporary blessings of this country, but you've received eternal blessings which will dawn on you one day. And we will be staggered. Well, I'm going to ask you to just take a moment of quiet. I'd like to bow your head. Let's just tell the Lord that we've not been good, thankful people for temporal and eternal blessings. And let's ask him to help us to be truly grateful people. Please pray quietly on your own.
Our Heavenly Father, you know us well. You know that we can talk about thanksgiving. You know that we can say thanks, we can say grace. But you know, our Heavenly Father, that much of what we say is platitudinous. We thank you for giving to us, so many of us in this room, something of a new spiritual attitude, recognizing that all these good things have come from you. And we pray that you would work in us, being saved and blessed, eternally blessed people, an increasing gratitude for Jesus. One that spills over, not only in our lives, but into the lives of others. We ask this in his name. Amen.